The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin McCabe with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Carbon Capture, Utilization and Storage, or CCUS, initiative, an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial. Today's event is brought to you by representatives from the United States Department of, Department of Energy and Industry Partners and is titled Direct Air Capture of CO2, Helping, helping to Achieve Net Zero Emissions. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. This option is preferred as it will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right hand side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the help desk at 1-888-259-3826. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type it in at any time during the webinar. Shortly following the conclusion of the event, the recording will be added to YouTube and the presentation slides will be uploaded to the Clean Energy Solutions Center site, links for which can be found on this slide. Before we launch into the presentations, I'll provide a quick introduction of today's panelists, followed by a welcome from Jared Daniels of the US Department of Energy, who will provide context for today's webinar. Then, following the panelists' presentations, we will have a question and answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience. Our first speaker today will be Jared Daniels, Director of the Office of Strategic Planning, Analysis, and Engagement with the U.S. Department of Energy. Following Jared will be Dr. Julio Friedman, Senior Research Scholar with the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Following Dr. Friedman will be Lori Getre, Vice President of, of Business Development with Carbon Engineering. Following Lori will be Christoph Beutler, Carbon Dioxide Removal Manager at Swiss Direct Air Capture Pioneers, Climeworks. Following Christoph will be Dr. Peter Eisenberger, Chief Technology Officer with Global Thermostat. And finally, we will hear from Mark Kevich, Director for the Division of Carbon Capture, Utilization, and Storage Research and Development at the Department of Energy. And with those brief introductions, I would now like to welcome Jared to the webinar. Jared? Great. Well, thank you, Kevin, for the, the introduction and welcome on behalf of the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS Initiative. We've established a new record of over a thousand registrations for today's webinar, so a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of our SEM CCUS initiative members. And thank you for giving us an hour of your time today. We also thank our excellent lineup of speakers we will hear from shortly. I'd like to briefly introduce the initiative to you all. The next slide shows that the Clean Energy Ministerial or the SEM process brings together 26 countries from around the world to jointly accelerate clean energy deployment. The SEM member countries make up 90% of clean energy investment globally, but they are also responsible for approximately 75% of global CO2 emissions. So this is a very relevant global partnership. The next slide shows the countries active in our CCUS initiative. The CCUS initiative is one of over 20 work stream SEM covering a wide range of clean energy technologies. Our members are a subset of the 12 SEM governments and our common objective is to accelerate carbon capture together. We have a joint leadership model with four countries providing the lead, Norway, Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. On the next slide, we see that we work to accelerate CCUS together, first by actively including CCUS within the broader global clean energy agenda and conversation. Secondly, by bringing together the private sector, governments, and the investment community, as they all have critical roles to play and must work well together. Thirdly, by facilitating identification of both near and longer term investment opportunities in carbon capture, utilization, and storage. And finally, by disseminating best practices 
including through webinars such as the one we are on today. Today's webinar is our first webinar with a technology theme. Direct Air Capture, or DAC, has received more attention recently, and we wanted to facilitate the sharing of current state of play with these technologies. It's important to highlight that while direct air capture is certainly important, we do not want to give you the impression that direct capture of CO2 from large point sources in various industries would be any less important. Quite the contrary. We stress that we will need a wide range of clean energy technologies, including a wide range of carbon capture solutions to respond to our global challenges. So with that as a very brief introduction to our SEM CCS initiative, I'd like to pass the floor to Julio Friedman to give us an introduction to today's theme of direct air capture. Julio? Thank you, Jared. It's a delight to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the Clean Energy Ministerial and the Department of Energy for hosting this and for inviting me. Uh, uh, if you'll see on the next slide, uh, this is what my home looked like last year. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Carrizo Bridge and near my home, uh, this separated me from my parents, uh, and as a consequence, I do not take climate change lightly at all. We have entered the age of consequences, and we are seeing more and more as a consequence. In this framework, we need to do more, and that includes not just renewables and efficiency, that includes not just point source capture, but increasingly we must return CO2 from the air and oceans to the geosphere, and direct air capture is one of the useful ways to do that. The next slide gives you a wider sense of this. Uh, the International Energy Agency looked at all of the existing infrastructure in the world, just what's already built or in the process of being built. And they said, if those plants and facilities run a natural capital life, what are the consequences of this with respect to climate? And the punchline is that we can't build anything ever anymore. Already, we have used 95% of a global climate budget for a two degree scenario. Uh, and that is assuming we do everything correctly. Any place where we slip, any place where we'll fall, we will blow a two degree carbon budget, much less a one and a half degree carbon budget. All one and a half degree trajectories require enormous amounts of CO2 removal, uh, something on the order of 10 or 20 billion tons a year for something on the order of 100 to a uh, thousand gigatons up to a trillion tons of CO2 removal by the end of the century. Next slide. In this context, uh, it is an enormous challenge. It is also an enormous opportunity. CO2 removal must begin pretty much now, and it will reach the scale and scope of the oil and gas industry if we want to balance our climate. As a consequence, the math itself demands this 10 to 20 gigatons of removal. At 50 to $100 a ton, that is a huge, huge market. Uh, part of what's driving that market is the fact that there are irreducible emissions. That's that green bar uh, at the bottom of uh, below 10 uh, gigatons a year to zero. We can reduce a certain number of things, but there's many things we simply don't know how to reduce uh, if we fail at anything, again, we'll have irre irreducible emissions. This is part of the work of CO2 removal. And if nothing else, I want the people joining us today on the webinar to recognize that net zero, which is the science-based target increasingly more and more companies are selecting, demands that any emissions are balanced by unemissions, that any emissions are balanced by removal. And that is part of the basis on which we will see more CO2 removal pathways rolling forward. In this, the National Academies recently did a substantial study on this. It was published about 18 months ago in October of 2018. And in their analysis, we do not have the tools we need today at scale to do the work. They estimated that at a minimum, 5 billion tons of CO2 removal using direct air capture would be required. That's a lot. That is the size of the oil industry today. 10 billion tons is the size of the oil and gas industry today. So it is an enormous, enormous latent and near-term opportunity. Next slide. So what is direct air capture? It's actually pretty simple. Uh, if you watched Apollo 13, 
you saw the scene where they had to build a CO2 scrubber on the fly. We've had the technology to remove CO2 from the air for a long time. It's just a little pricier than we'd like. And the reason why is because ambient air is very low concentrated with respect to CO2. It is 400 parts per million. That makes it 300 times less concentrated than say from a coal fired power plant. But we know how to do it. We can use solvents, we can use sorbents, we can use membranes, other technologies, and basically just separate it. So on one side, if you put in energy, you get out low CO2 air, and you get a stream of CO2 that can either be used or can be returned to the geosphere for permanent displacement. Next slide. The advantage of direct air capture is you can basically put it anywhere. And wherever there's storage, you can do this. There's no resource constraint. There are cost constraints. It is expensive, but you're not limited physically. What we have also seen is that costs have dropped really dramatically. Uh, the first million ton plant is in the process of commissioning. It's expected that that will come in uh, somewhere between $120 and $200 a ton. We'll see. Uh, but this report by the Rhodium Group suggest that under all circumstances, the first million tons will come in between $125 and $325 a ton, and that with deployment and with innovation, the cost will drop dramatically. So say by the time we're at about 100 million tons a year of capture from the air, we'll be below 200 bucks a ton. All of the panelists today will talk about their technologies and will talk about their price projections and cost projections. So you'll have a chance to think about these in this context. But I want to point out that any clean energy technology reduces costs through deployment, and direct air capture is no exception. So today's costs are already much cheaper than previous estimates had done, and will become cheaper still. Next slide. If there's one thing I want you to leave here knowing, it's that the time for happy talk is over. We just simply got to do a lot more. We have to invest in innovation. We got to put our money to work. Next slide. In that context, we know the problem. We need to rethink our approach. So if you will hit the next slide again, we are kind of past a moral hazard discussion. All options are acceptable and required. And we have to be humble about how hard this is and generous about the range of options available to us. We also have to really focus on carbon. Tons are the metrics. Uh, in this, we are going to need more innovation. We're going to try more stuff. And that innovation is not going to be limited to technology. It will also be innovation in policy and finance and in business model. Increasingly, I ask the audience to focus not on what we should do, but instead what we can do. And direct air capture is something we can do. In that context, I am happy to introduce the next panelist with the next slide. Uh, this is uh, Lori Gaitry. Uh, the Vice President of Business Development for Carbon Engineering. Lori, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Julio. And hi, everyone. Thanks for your time and for your interest in direct air capture. And many thanks to the CCUS initiative for coordinating this session. Climate scientists have known for a long time what Julio just described to us, that we're barreling toward a big problem with too much CO2 in our atmosphere. Our founder, founder of Carbon Engineering, David Keith, was an advisor to Bill Gates on climate, and they knew that the world would need a new tool in the toolbox, a technological solution to pull CO2 from the atmosphere at very large scale and at very low cost. So in 2009, Carbon Engineering was founded to tackle that goal. Next slide, please, Kevin. Fast forward 11 years to today, the technology is ready, We've published a detailed techno-economic analysis for our standard commercial DAC plant design that removes 1 million tons of atmospheric CO2 per year, and we're commercializing that technology. The core new technology that we bring is shown in purple here, large-scale DAC at low cost. The question is, how do you put that CO2 to work once you've captured it to make it economic to build this critical infrastructure? It turns out that there are two primary markets for that atmospheric CO2 today. One where you simply sequester that CO2 permanently underground, providing negative emissions to help governments, companies, and individuals decarbonize. The other is to take that atmospheric carbon and combine it with hydrogen to make liquid fuels like diesel and jet fuel. In the fuel synthesis case, you're recycling the carbon in the atmosphere rather than pulling new fossil fuel out of the ground. 
Carbon Engineering has implemented both of these solutions at our plant in Canada. Next slide, please. Key to our large scale, low cost solution is that we've used off the shelf equipment from other industries in a clever way. I'll talk you through the process diagram from left to right. Keep your eye on the purple text as those are the process elements that contain the atmospheric CO2. In fact, you can think of our process like a bucket brigade that passes water buckets along to put out a fire. In this case, the process chemicals in each stage are being put to work to move CO2 through one, from one step to the next, and then returning to the previous step to pick up some more CO2. We start on the left with the very dilute atmospheric CO2 at a concentration of about 0.04%. This is the trickiest part of the process as we have to move a massive amount of air through the system to catch those dilute CO2 molecules. In carbon engineering's case, we use a liquid capture solution of potassium hydroxide that has an affinity for CO2 and creates a CO2 rich solution of potassium carbonate for the next step. We pass the solution into a pellet reactor where the carbonate and calcium ions meet and we precipitate out calcium carbonate essentially little white seashells that you could hold in your hand. Those pellets are then passed into a calciner and heated up to release the CO2. The potassium and calcium each loop back to the previous stage to pick up more CO2, and this helps us achieve those low operating costs. The output from the process on the right-hand side is a pure stream of CO2. Next slide, please. The creation of liquid fuels from CO2 is not new either but we chose to implement the fuel synthesis building blocks at our pilot plant in order to demonstrate the process and confirm our techno-economic analysis. So you might ask if it's possible to create fuel from atmospheric CO2, why isn't anyone already doing that at scale? The answer is that low cost DAC is just one of the required building blocks and we have an alignment of other stars happening right now as well. We're seeing the costs for the other components, such as renewable hydrogen generation, renewable energy, such as wind and solar, and fuel synthesis all coming down at the same time. The outcome is the ability to create ultra low carbon fuels with atmospheric CO2 that have all of the advantages that I list over on the right. What you also see on the right is a picture of our synthetic fuel, which is the clear liquid on the right burning alongside traditional fossil diesel on the left. What's valuable about our fuel in the market is what you can't see, the ultra low carbon intensity, but it's a nice co-benefit for clean air efforts that our synthetic fuel burns cleanly without the sulfur and nitrogen oxides that you typically get when you combust fossil fuels. Next slide, please Kevin. We get inbound requests from across the globe almost every day by individuals through to large governments asking us about net zero. People really want to help but there's sometimes limited awareness of the size of the problem to get to net zero. So I've included a typical abatement curve, in this case from Goldman Sachs, looking at how much it costs to decarbonize and where we're actually at today. On the x-axis, you'll see the world's current yearly greenhouse gas emissions, 52 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. What jumps out and is noted as number one in purple, is the fact that we don't actually have solutions above about 38 gigatons at any cost. So that's a really big problem if we wanna to get to net zero. Problem number two is that the curve climbs steeply as you approach 38 gigatons up to the, that level of $1,000 a ton that Julio mentioned. The third problem is that with a growing population, we're on our way to 80 gigatons if we stick to the business as usual scenarios. And fourth, this only looks at abating today's emissions. It doesn't tackle all of the legacy CO2 molecules floating around in the atmosphere that are already causing climate change. What's clear from this curve is that we need to focus today on accelerating all solutions, DAC and otherwise, that are both affordable and can scale to meet the net zero challenge. Next slide, please. The good news is that there is a solution today that can solve the abatement gap is affordable, has the potential to scale, and supports climate restoration by pulling out legacy CO2. We know that we can fix this, and we're doing everything we can to move as fast as we can to make this techno technological solution available to the world at scale. Next slide, please. 
If you could do the end-to-end -end capture and safe and permanent sequestration of that CO2 for $150 a ton, this is what would happen to the abatement curve. You'd have the option to go all the way to net zero and you could cap the cost. You'd still need 6% of global GDP, which is a staggering sum, but you'd have net zero in hand. Even better, if you continue to innovate today on direct air capture, sequestration, and the creation of carbon products to bring those technology costs down now so that you bring net zero, net zero within more affordable reach. Next slide, please, Kevin. Here's a final look at how we see these technological solutions rolling out. In 2018, we announced, in cooperation with Occidental Low Carbon Ventures, that we were proceeding with the front-end engineering and design of our first commercial scale DAC plant in the Permian Basin. That plant will capture 1 million tons of atmospheric CO2 every year, and it will be a blueprint for broad plant rollout across the globe. In addition to our work in the Permian, and just like water treatment infrastructure gives us clean water today, this air treatment infrastructure will get built out in the coming decade in jurisdictions with the strongest policies and highest targets. I should note that this is an opportunity for huge economic development, as not only do these plants each create over a thousand construction jobs and over a hundred steady state operations jobs, they enable the build out of additional renewable energy projects like wind and solar. Our current DAC design will be a workhorse for decades to come. And as with any technology, we are doing and will continue to do ongoing innovation. By 2050, as Julio noted, we see DAC-based solutions playing a significant role in the global effort to achieve net zero, using atmospheric CO2 not only for negative emissions and fuels, but also in many other carbon products. We're excited to be talking with leading companies and governments across the world, some of whom simply want to decarbonize as part of their sustainability plans, and some who have passed net zero into law, all who want to make a difference and help catalyze those solutions to climate change. Finally, there are a bunch of folks around the world working on climate restoration to safe levels like 350 parts per million or even 300 parts per million. At Carbon Engineering, we believe that DAC will accelerate our path not only to net zero, but then onward to the important work of climate restoration. Thanks and back over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Laurie. We'll now move on to Christoph Beutler. Go ahead, Christoph. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you for organizing this event. Um, yes, we are Climeworks, and uh, like Carbon Engineering, we have been uh, founded in 2009, so uh, we are also 10 years old. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Kevin. With this, I quickly want to give an overview of uh, what we do before. I mainly want to focus on the big picture of why DAC is needed, and I won't go so much into the nitty gritty of our technology because it is quite similar to uh, the next presenter, Global Thermostat, and I believe Peter will introduce the technical side in more detail. So, as I've said, we are Climeworks and we have already 14 plants in operation across Europe. Northernmost is in Iceland, southernmost is in Italy. Um, I, I believe we're also the largest company at around 100 full-time equivalents uh, with headquarters in Zurich and Cologne in Germany. And we are already supplying uh, CO2 to customers. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see our one of our plants in Hinwil, and in the back you can see a greenhouse and this plant supplies the co2 that we capture from the air as fertilizer to the greenhouse in the in the background we also supply co2 to coca-cola which they use um, for uh, mineral water to for the bubbles in in the mineral water and that's already in store so so this technology is already um, commercial. Uh, we have a modular approach, so you can you can see uh, our collector modules, and six of them fit into a 40-foot container. And this is also uh, how we plan to scale up. I will talk about that in a in a minute. Uh, quickly on the energy source, so we need around 100 uh, degrees centigrade to desorb our filters, and that's about four fifths of our 
energy requirements which we can take from for example waste heat as we do in in this case from a waste incineration plant and we also re need renewable electricity to run mainly our fans and, and auxiliaries. We have a minimal carbon footprint, which is very important if you are in the business of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So over a full cradle to grave LCA, we are at 90 to 95% net efficiency, depending on where you put the plant up and depending on the particular technology. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is uh, our scale up roadmap. Uh, Julio already mentioned the time for talking is over we really really have to to scale up to stay within the the paris uh, agreement goals um we are currently with this technology that is commercial at 600 dollars per ton and we foresee to get to 100 dollars per ton with within a decade mainly uh, with the scale up of the size of the plants so later this year we will uh, build another plant in Iceland at a capacity of roughly 3,000 tons delivering negative emissions which we are also already selling to customers. Next slide please. So I want to give two examples why we need direct air capture and why this is really needed to, to get us out of, of the, the problem of, of scale. So as Laurie already hinted you can take CO2 from the atmosphere combine it with uh, green hydrogen for example or renewable electricity and um, make e-fuels fuels from thin air basically and if we scale this up you can we foresee that these can be in the in the region of the fossil alternatives we have today and because you take the co2 out of the atmosphere first these fuels are near or can be near uh, carbon neutral so they are a real solution next slide please so this is a, a comparison of the 2010 U European Union transport energy demand. And if you were to satisfy that demand with first generation corn biofuel, you would need the land area of that gray circle you see drawn around the landmass of Europe. And the conclusion is it's, it doesn't work because it's bigger than the landmass of Europe. And if you were to um, deploy an e-fuel uh, system at scale, we could do this at 4,200 square kilometers, and that includes the renewable energy you need to run the system. So you can think of direct air capture as a very efficient, space efficient photosynthesis, and it is therefore a real solution for the fuels and materials we have to um, create to replace the fossil fuel inputs into the system to get to net zero emissions. Next slide, please. Um, this is our negative uh, emissions operations. It's currently a, a small demonstrator you see at the, at the bottom of the right hand side of the big picture, where uh, at the Hellshady geothermal power plant in Iceland, we uh, capture CO2 from the air. We use the energy from the geothermal power plant to run uh, this machine. And we, with our partners, uh, uh, we have developed a methodology to inject this CO2 from the air into the basaltic rock underneath and therefore create a negative emission uh, maybe as a side note the co2 material uh, mineralizes within two years and it's, it's it's the safest possible form of storage you can really think about again this is this is uh, not commercial yet it will be commercial by the end of the year when we build the big plant but it has been demonstrated and it works next slide please so again, uh, the, the reason why you know we we don't plant trees, which you ab absolutely should do, is is a scale. So the, the the problem with with the the you know the, the the amounts of negative emissions that are already foreseen in the scenarios, uh, as Julio mentioned, is that we simply again will not have enough land mass to achieve the scale that we need to achieve. Um, we have other technologies like BEX and and maybe enhanced weathering, which is at earlier stages of development that can help but uh, after all we know at the moment nothing can be so you know space efficient as direct air capture so this is a calculation to capture eight gigatons um, and it is again including the renewable energy in this case we always calculate with pv panels that are needed to run the whole system and, and these include about these are about 97 98 percent of the surface area needed so uh, the takeaway point is direct air capture can make this really, really 
uh, small or space efficient. Next uh, and last slide, please. And as 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 Laurie already hinted, the the abatement costs of the the, the bio based solutions or, or mit conventional mitigations uh, will will go up. And direct air capture really is a, a very very large opportunity to to develop a solution where the costs will will come down uh, with scaling over time. I just want to stress the fact that it is really really important that we we start this this scaling and development now and therefore we need policies and incentives to really really bring this into the mass market so that we can have the scales that are needed in in later decades to achieve our our paris uh, climate goals that's really all from 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 me maybe as a as a lead in to peter's talk i i, I quickly want to say that we uh, also like global thermos that use a, a solid sorbent mm -hmm. approach I and so the technology is really quite similar. So with this, Peter, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph, and thank you to the organizers for giving us the opportunity, all of us the opportunity to tell people about the great capability that that can bring to our challenge of climate change. Uh, I will describe the breakthroughs in global thermostats direct air capture technology that at scale can achieve under $50 per ton costs. As has been said, that can play a crucial role in going beyond net zero emissions and indeed addressing the threat of catastrophic climate change. But the aspect that I think is most important is that low cost CO2 produced by direct air capture, together with low cost renewable energy, enables a renewable energy and materials economy, which I call REMI, that transforms the threat of climate change into an opportunity for sustainable development that meets the needs of 9 billion people while at the same time removing the threat of climate change. The threat of catastrophic climate is imminent and recent events have made it painfully clear that we need to come together and mobilize a global effort to address it now. As opposed to the Corona-19 virus, the positive feedback between economic development and the environment enabled by RIMI provides a solution to the threat of climate change that will initiate a period of global prosperity rather than destroy our economy. Of course, in this talk, I will not be able to provide the details of the above assertions, but they are available in a link I will provide at the end of my presentation. But first, to the breakthroughs of our technology. Next slide. Our prosperity. Uh, our priority honeycomb contactor with its parallel channels enables very low resistance laminar flow, which allows one to pass fan driven high velocity air, and its very high surface area enables efficient contacting of the walls by the CO2 in the air. The walls contain our proprietary solvent, which removes the CO2 with very high selectivity. Our use of low temperature steam directly contacting the walls enables the use of low temperature steam to rapidly collect CO2 at low cost. As shown in the next slide, these breakthroughs together uh, enable us at scale, and as Christoph said, we have to get going now to get to scale, to lose CO2 at under $50 per ton. They are driven by the increased efficiency created by our contact that gives us high throughput, that produces, uh, reduces the capex and reduces the opex for moving the air. And by use of low temperature heat, we reduce the uh, opex of the cost of that heat. And because we can do it rapidly, we also increase our throughput. As indicated, we've developed a technology, as indicated on the next slide, we have developed uh, this technology via a, a series of pilot plants and commercial demo plants. Our, com our company tested its proprietary air capture process at a pilot plant at SSRR in 2011, confirming that process could indeed very rapidly and efficiently cap capture CO2. We also have a proprietary food gas capture technology using the same basic process. Its performance was demonstrated at SR SRI in 2013, and that at scale can capture CO2 at under $25 a ton. Finally, in 2018, we built our first commercial DAC plant. Because of the high throughput of the GT technology, 
two shipping containers produce 4,000 tons of CO2 per, air, per, per year. At scale, GT's high throughput technology captures CO2 at a rate per square meter of ground surface 100,000 times as fast as trees do. And its use of waste heat enables it to decrease its demand for its use energy. On the next slide, it shows that GT has had partners in developing this technology. And, the, uh, and, uh, and it, it, it now has a growing list of partners and customers with interest spanning from using CO2 from synthetic fuel production via both electrolysis and algae, desalination, beverages, and beverages, and of course, materials. GT is committed to optimize the rate of implementation rather than the profitability because it is dedicated to address the threat of climate change. It will only grant non-exclusive licenses to ensure broad implementation and access to its technology by the development countries. As the next slide shows, direct air capture, which harvests CO2 from the sky by trees, can be used to make our energy and materials that we need. In doing so, it enables an industrial form of photosynthesis, which is under our control. And if used to make materials like carbon fiber or aggregate for concrete, will be a form of CCUS that sequesters the CO2 more permanently than trees and generates carbon neutral liquid fuels. Both are products that mix and generate wealth, rather than be a cost to the economy. As shown in the next slide, The act together with renewable energy enables the green economy where the inputs are sun, water, uh, water and air, and the outputs are energy and materials that support human life. This mimics the natural process of, process of photosynthesis and thus creates a positive feedback between development and the environment. As shown in the next slide, Rimi has this positive feedback because the larger the the renewable economy, more climate protection and healthy ecosystems because we generate more opportunity to sequester carbon. When nature uses more sun, more CO2, and more water, it produces a healthy ecosystem and limit a tropical jungle, not environmental degradation. Since Rimi mimics nature, it is in harmony with it. And the more sun and water and CO2 from the air we use, the healthier both us and the rest of life will be. As shown by Julio, and on the next slide, we have currently a carbon intensive economy. The opportunities, to so we have a large opportunities to monetize CO2 from the air and the positive feedback created by me will increase the demand for those carbon intensive products moving into the future. But to replace fossil carbon as a source of carbon, it and the cost of renewable energy are needed to be low. As shown in the next slide, uh, the, the V the technologies at scale uh, can produce uh, already by many have already asserted solar energy at costs of one to two cents per kilowatt hour, which in turn can be used to make synthetic hydrogen at one cents a kilogram from water. And with together with the fifty dollar per ton CO two, which is equivalent to twenty dollar per barrel oil in terms of its carbon content, one can produce competitively priced uh, uh, fuels and hydrocarbons and building materials. And as noted, the enhanced feedback that will enhance the economic growth will create enough opportunity to sequester carbon to meet the Paris targets. Thus, in summary, I would, would what I hope I've been able to at least uh, raise an idea in your, for you is that through a renewable and energy materials economy, we can create a sustainable solution by performing an industrial version of photosynthesis where the inputs are sun, air, and water. And that, because it's in harmony with nature, it has a positive feedback between development and the environment, which, can, which, will, which will greatly increase economic growth and prosperity, and in so doing, provide energy security and climate change protection. The thing I want to stress is what Christoph said at the end of his talk. We have no more time as the pandemic, recent pandemic has shown us. We have the, the we know the technologies that will get us to 
address the challenges we need while meeting our needs. We just have to begin now to do it. And so uh, with that, I'd like to end my talk and just uh, thank the organizers again and indicate to you where you can download the paper on the renewable and energy materials economy that will provide the details that I've been unable to provide in the short time of this talk. Thank you, Peter. We'll now move on to Mark Akevich. Mark. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you very much for the opportunity today. And uh, it was great hearing the other presenters and the work and opportunities that they're presenting on first generation technologies. Uh, if we go to the next slide. What I'm going to spend a few minutes on, and we heard some of this earlier today in Julio's talk, when he spoke about uh, innovation, is opportunity, opportunities to further reduce costs. I first want to draw your attention to key, two key activities from the U.S. over the past year and a half. First is the National Academy of Sciences report on negative emission technologies and reliable sequestration, which, which took a broad approach and covered direct air capture along with other negative emission technologies. As a follow-on to this effort, the Department of Energy hosted a workshop with the U.S. Energy uh, association on direct air capture technology needs and this workshop occurred last july both highlighted the challenge that currently the more dilute the stream typically the more challenging and costly to separate co2 this also presents opportunities to innovate and drive down costs as, as shown on, on this list First is materials development and process optimization efforts that can that can further reduce these costs. Uh, while while direct air capture uh, is typically noted that it can be cited anywhere, uh, to really optimize its value, uh, you need to understand what are the resource and logistical challenges in terms of land use, siting, access to energy sources, et cetera. Uh, finally, uh, integration with with DAC along with other conversion operations is critically important as well um, when you're thinking about what are the additional products and markets that you are trying to achieve and how to integrate the direct air capture systems with these additional conversion technologies. Um, if we go to the next slide. So based on the input from the NAS report and the, and the workshop, DOE developed a draft R&D plan and timeline for advanced DAC technology development. Over the next several years, we plan to make investments in advanced materials and technologies at the laboratory and bench scale, ultimately moving to small pilot test units and larger test units with the goal of having advanced technologies that can be incorporated and integrated into commercial systems by 2035. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I do want to highlight uh, two two recent uh, activities. Uh, one is with DOE, and then the other is the uh, actually the, with the Internal Revenue Service. And this was mentioned somewhat briefly earlier, but I do want to spend a, a little bit of time on the 45Q tax credit for those that are unaware of of its uh, of, of this credit. The first is that the tax credit offers a $35 per ton credit for CO2 that is utilized, and that includes enhanced oil recovery as well as other utilization options, and also a $50 per ton credit for saline storage. Uh, there are certain thresholds uh, for qualification for DAC to qualify, and it is 100 kilotons of CO2 per year for storage and EOR, and 25 kilotons of CO2 per year for utilization. Finally, what I want to highlight are some recent, is a recent announcement by DOE um, in Mark, with our office in collaboration with our Office of Science that announced $22 million for advanced technology research on direct air capture systems. Uh, the Office of Science, these are two separate funding opportunity announcements. Uh, the one is focused on the Office of Science's national laboratory systems, looking at advanced materials and chemical sciences. And then the other is our division of CCUS R&D 
which is focusing also on applied materials development as well as process and pilot type scale activities. So with that, um, thank you. And uh, I will turn it back over to Kevin. Thanks, Mark. And thank you to each of our panelists for those outstanding presentations. As we shift to the q and I'd like to remind our attendees to please submit questions using the question pane at any time. We do have some great questions from the audience that we'll use the remaining time to answer and discuss. Uh, the first question, uh, a bit of a current event. Uh, many DAC investments are funded by oil companies. How will the steep drop in oil price impact funding of these future investments? So let me start by volunteering that uh, I'm not 100% sure that's true. Certainly, uh, companies like Occidental and Chevron have invested in direct air capture. It is also the case that a lot of the investments have come from uh, high net worth individuals and angels. Uh, a lot of the investments have come from uh, a wider set of funds. And certainly, governments are beginning to ramp up. I think it is fair to ask about this in general. Uh, what I see is that in the middle of this pandemic, both BP and Shell have made major announcements that they are uh, seeking to stick to their goals for net zero by 2050. The president of Shell, uh, Ben Van Burden, said two days ago that they are only planning to sell oil in the future to companies that and supply chains that are also net zero. We have seen Amazon and Microsoft make announcements around net zero. So it's hard to know how any of this will play out, but I see many oil and gas companies remaining committed to net zero as core business. And I also see a wider set of interests and aperture for increased funding. In particular, companies like Delta, uh, Microsoft and Amazon, I've already mentioned, Walmart are beginning to put money to work and have been explicit about their interests in financing DAC projects and CO2 removal with DAC as part of their work. I guess I'd like to add, Mr. Peter Eisenberger, that the, this is a global problem, and without a global agreement of how to address it, uh, we will not succeed in meeting, addressing the threat of climate change. And therefore, I think it's very important as we go about implementing these technologies that we ensure they're equitably, equitably distributed around the globe, and that all countries can participate and the global prosperity that they can that can be enabled by turning the CO2 recapture into valuable products. Yeah, maybe if I uh, might add Christoph here from Climeworks. So we don't have any investments from oil and gas, um, but what I can say is that in the past weeks we have seen no slowdown of interest from businesses, as Julio mentioned. You know. On the contrary, even even airlines, uh, you know, in, in this current situation, are more keen than ever to to develop uh, solutions that can take them to to net zero emissions. So so the current crisis um, is really not an issue, at least for us. And maybe I'll close it out by saying that um, the thing that will um, that is motivating and accelerating direct air capture are the policies that that reward. Um, the the sequestration or the use of atmospheric co2 um, and those are unchanged and and in fact the demand for um use of atmospheric co2 um we believe will far outpace the the possible rate at which we could supply it so um both from the voluntary as as julio mentioned um companies that are declaring net zero and voluntarily moving forward as well as the low carbon fuel standards and other policies that are um already rewarding direct air capture we 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 think that we can't keep up with supply based on the, the growing demand I, I would be this is peter again i would be remiss if i did, I did not mention that our partner exxon mobile has been very helpful in working with us to scale up our technology can operate at the global scale needed for a climate change, uh, to address the climate change threat. Great, thank you. Yeah, Laurie brought up a, a good point about uh, the, the role of policy 
Uh, I'd like to get back to that, but there was a theme throughout some of those answers regarding um, the interconnectedness of, the, of this industry. Um, to that point, are there opportunities for collaboration between DAC technology providers and users? Uh, for example, uh, using shared DAC uh, carbon storage infrastructure? Unquestionably. And uh, in point of fact, I think we're going to find these uh, existing infrastructure for carbon capture and storage will serve as a launching pad for direct air capture projects. Uh, in some cases, these will be opportune. Uh, so something like Port Arthur in Texas, for example, might serve as a place to do direct air capture as well. It might be uh, bespoke, for example, thinking about the European hubs and clusters that are emerging now. Many of them have been overt about their interest in combining direct air capture into, say, the Humber cluster or Teesside or Rotterdam. Yeah, and Kevin, this is Jared. Getting back to these conversations in terms of policy and infrastructure, we were just on a conversation earlier this morning across our SEM CCUS uh, countries in terms of how do we best share best practices and uh, other opportunities moving forward. If there are government policies that are meant to stimulate uh, economic progress uh, after this pandemic or to help uh, rebuild after this pandemic, ensuring that a, a broad set of supporting uh, infrastructure for carbon capture utilization and storage broadly um, that would support all forms of CCUS, including direct air capture, uh, that's an active conversation in many governments are around the world today. Um, and we expect, as Julio mentioned, for, for that to continue going forward. There's no one-size-fits-all policy mechanism or tool, um, but that are, there are many of them that have been used successfully in the past for emerging and advanced uh, low-carbon technologies, and certainly uh, some of them, and perhaps others at a national level and subnational level, uh, can be harnessed and used well to support CCUS broadly, and again, uh, direct air capture in specific. And I'd like to stress the fact that how you how we implement our uh, DAC technologies will have a big impact on how they are disseminated. And therefore, I think one has to re use novel approaches to ensure maximization of implementation rather than the maximization of profit. In addition, I think while it's important for the rest of the world to organize themselves so that we can address the threat, it's also important for us in the DAC community to find ways to cooperate with each other because this is not an issue of competition. We're all, as they say, in the pandemic in this together and we have to find ways to enable and help each other achieve the potential that DAC can provide for the rest of the planet. Yeah, maybe following uh, on from that, I, I want to just point out one mechanism that's very close to my heart. So if you, if you talk to policymakers, um, what they usually want to do is, you know, raise the, the price of, of carbon taxes towards, uh, you know, the, the f in the future. And, you know, technologies like direct air capture need, need the exact opposite mechanisms. If we, uh, for example, think about the 45Q that is currently at, at you know, $50 uh, and therefore out of reach for, for any current, you know, direct air capture technologies because it hasn't reached those those low levels yet so we really need to get going in designing policies where we have high you know per ton prices but maybe a very very small amount of of tonnage you can you can have funded with these policies and then you know the policies have to become lower in price per ton and and, and have to increase in terms of the the scale you have to deliver to tap into that funding and, and something that like that could really really you know, move move us in the direction we need to move. That's great, thank you. Um, kind of shifting gears a little bit, uh, we had an interesting, interesting question submitted. Um, as the use of DAC expands, uh, would you expect the same level of issues regarding public acceptance, uh, perhaps as some other CCS projects have encountered? Um, how can we, so to say, pave the way now to mitigate such risks in the future. I think this webinar is a great example of, of what we need to do. We really, um, I think in, in our experience, uh, once people have understood what, what we bring in the, the potential for DAC to help 
uh, in all kinds of different ways, um, there's there's really um, great acceptance of that. I think what we're missing, given that DAC technology is relatively new and not understood, is really just more awareness. So, so I think this webinar is an, a great example of, of the kinds of things that we need to do just to help that happen. Of course, in the end, there's no, no alternative but to show that it works and to have real live examples, some of which uh, I think Climeworks has been the pioneer in giving demonstrations of ways that that can be used. And I think that's been very helpful in achieving greater uh, uh, public uh, acceptance. And I, I, I think the, the whole concept of REMI is to, to counteract the notion that addressing the climate change threat has to be a kind of a cost to economy to prevent us from having the developing countries achieve the development they need to get their people out of poverty. If that tension is removed, then it provides a basis for us all coming together and working because it's a win-win for all. Yeah, maybe adding on to, to what but what Peter just said, uh, of course, uh, you know, next to, to education and, and webinars like this one, uh, you know, building the plants and showcasing them, I completely agree with Peter, is really, really important. And, um, you know, from a perspective of a company who, who's done that multiple times, I can say that, you know, the, the response has been uh, great and, and we don't really see an issue with public acceptance. And maybe also, you know, the, the reason with, with uh, public acceptance around uh, around CCS is often that you know people fear that it might keep the fossil economy going. I'm not saying we don't need CCS. What I want to get into is to say that you know direct air capture is really something that is 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 different because we are capturing from the air. And uh, so you know surely that that this cannot be wrong to to clean up the atmosphere. Which this is exactly what's needed. So we at Climax don't foresee this as a as a big topic. You know, it, you know, society moves by means, concepts, and if we look back at the history of addressing the climate change threat, we had an era in the past where we said that renewables uh, and energy efficiency and conservation would be enough. Uh, we then moved into the era of carbon capture and storage for a long period of time, sort of clean coal technology, and now there's this new concept a direct air capture can provide an additional way to actually uh, un, uh, remove the previous emitted CO2 that threatens ca catastrophic climate change. And I think that mean gets, doesn't get established because there's so many different ideas that people have of how to approach and address the threat of climate change. So I think there's some need for the community as a whole to come together and find a way to come with a unified consensus as to a strategy of how to focus all our resources in a way that will maximize the rate at which climate change protection is provided. Great, thank you once again, everyone, for your uh, participation in today's Q&A session. In the interest of time, I think we'll have to move on. Uh, okay. There was an incredible amount of interest in this webinar and uh, a number of questions that we didn't get to. So. Uh, for those uh, questions that we did not have time to get to, we'll connect with those attendees offline after the webinar. Uh, before we conclude, the CCUS initiative is excited to announce our upcoming webinars. We'll first hear about carbon capture utilization and storage in the Gulf region next month, and later hear about CCUS developments in Japan in June. Once final details are confirmed, a formal announcement, announcement will be released via LinkedIn, Twitter, and various email listservs as well. We look forward to providing further opportunities to hear about CCUS developments throughout the world. If you want to learn more about the CCUS initiative or want to learn more about the presenters and organizations we heard from today, please reach out to the initiative coordinator at the email displayed on this slide or visit the links provided here. For other news and developments, follow us on LinkedIn by following the link displayed here and at Twitter at CCUS SEM. A kind reminder that these slides will be, will be provided at the Clean Energy Solutions Center website cleanenergysolutions.org. One more time, I'd like to extend a thank you to our panelists and to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We very much appreciate your time and hope in return that there were some valuable insights that you can take back to your ministries, departments, or organizations. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future CCUS events. This concludes our webinar.